Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we are talking about a 2500 mile road trip that I just went on in the winter in my Tesla Model 3 and so temperatures were as low as 0 degrees Fahrenheit minus 18 degrees Celsius. Rarely did temperatures get above freezing. Uh, you know there were parking lots covered in ice where the superchargers are. The back of the car got covered in snow. The wheels got snow in them. Uh, this was a proper winter test across 2500 miles and I also experienced the first supercharger that I pulled up to and it did not work. Um, so we're going to talk about broken superchargers as well. It was a good experience. Now this video has been about 18 months in the making because about 18 months ago I did 2,000 miles in my Tesla Model 3 in the summer. And so I wanted to see, you know what, if temperatures are a lot cooler, how does that differ? And so the 2,000 mile road trip that I did in the summer, I took basically basically that exact same 2,000 mile portion as part of the 2,500 mile road trip that I just did, just in the opposite direction. And so we're going to compare those two 2,000 mile portions directly with the temperature difference being about 50 to 80 degrees, depending on the day. In the summer, it was mostly around 70s, 80s. And then for this road trip, it was, you know, around zero degrees Fahrenheit to about 30 degrees Fahrenheit for most of the trip. So first off, let's talk about navigation. Tesla makes this super easy. Um, there's no real adjustments for it. Basically, you just sit in your car, you tell it exactly where you wanna go, 2,500 miles away, and it gives you the route, including all of the supercharger stops where you stop to plug in and charge up, and tells you how long you need to sit at each supercharger station. Now, what Tesla does is they optimize fewest number of stops. So they show you how to get to wherever you're going, stopping the least amount of times. And we'll talk about whether or not that's a good strategy or bad strategy or fine strategy, whatever. Either way, they make it very easy for you uh, and you just plug in where you wanna go. They tell you everything you need to do, super simple. Now, as you look out here, you can see there's snow on the ground. Uh, this has been a, a good cold test. And so what's challenging about the cold? And really it's two things. So first of all, batteries, you know, the powertrain doesn't like to be cold. Batteries are gonna operate at their happiest state, their most efficient state uh, with a bit of temperature in them. And so that's part of it. The other part of it is, of course, you wanna keep this cabin warm. And so throughout my entire 2,500 mile drive, I had the interior of this cabin at about 70 to 72 degrees, depending on whatever I was feeling like that day at that time. But I kept it comfortable the entire time. I was never, you know, turning off things to see, you know, hey, how much range can I get? The intention was I want to be comfortable. I want to see how this thing does using a car like you would use any car. So I kept it comfortable the whole time. So that heat comes from resistive heaters. Now this is a 2018 Tesla Model 3 performance. Some of the newer ones like the Tesla Model Y and future models of the Tesla Model 3 will come with a heat pump. And so a heat pump is more efficient, uh, but basically with these resistive heaters, like what I am using, any heat that you put within this cabin, it comes directly from that battery pack. Uh, so the battery pack is used to create heat in the cabin. So, you know, as far as an efficient way of driving, it's not really because you're using energy to keep yourself comfortable rather than using energy to move yourself. So that was the big question to me, you know, how much of a difference is this going to make being cold uh, on my range and my efficiency? And so I looked at a AAA study from a couple years ago where AAA they took five different electric cars and they compared their range uh, you know at different temperatures and they dropped them down to about 20 degrees Fahrenheit driving in 20 degrees Fahrenheit and across these five vehicles one of which included a Tesla they said the average range drop was 41 percent so nearly cutting your range in half to drive around at 20 degrees Fahrenheit and so that to me was like oh god like that's bad like that is not good if you're us losing that much of your range just because of the temperature outside and so what I wanted to know was like, is this road trip going to be miserable? Am I going to be miserable on this winter road trip or is it actually possible? Uh, because, you know, if, if it's that big of a drop, 41%, that can be kind of detrimental to electric cars in that, you know, some people need them for this scenario. And so can it actually work in this scenario? So how did it do? Well, for most of this video, I want to compare just the 2000 mile segment that is equivalent to the 2000 mile segment I did in the summer. So we're comparing a 2,000 mile drive in the winter versus a 2,000 mile drive in the summer. And so what was the difference in energy used? 
Well, in the summer, it averaged 285 watt hours per mile over those 2,000 miles. In the winter, it averaged 338 watt hours per mile over those 2,000 miles. And so that was about a 19% increase uh, in energy used, meaning about, you know, 80% of the range that you had um, in the winter versus how much range you have in the summer. Now, if you look at range um, based on the averages, for my summer road trip, the average range of a 100% full battery pack was 250 miles. For my winter road trip, the average range for a 100% full battery pack was 212 miles. So about a 40 mile drop in range, um, about 20% due to having those colder temperatures and heating the cabin. Now, what about worst case? One of those legs of that 2000 mile drive in the summer, uh, as I mentioned, we were getting temperatures as low as zero degrees Fahrenheit, minus 18 degrees Celsius. And I think the high during that leg was like seven degrees Fahrenheit. It was a very cold leg. And on that leg, I had about 384 watt hours per mile. It also included a little bit of elevation gain. Um, and so, you know, not all that bad. I mean, it could have been a lot worse compared to these studies that I saw saying, you know, 41% drop. Um, my worst leg in the winter compared to my worst leg in the summer, uh, you know, was still in that 15 to 20% range increase um, as far as like how much more range would you have in the summer. I think another interesting way of comparing is looking at mile per gallon equivalent. So one gallon of gasoline is equivalent to 33.7 kilowatt hours. So if you look at that 2000 mile drive, in the summer it took the equivalent of about 16 and a half gallons of gas, which is pretty incredible. 16 gallons to go, you know, 2000 miles. In the winter, uh, it took 20 gallons, the equivalent of 20 gallons of gas to travel those 200 miles or 2000 miles. So, you know, again, 100 miles per gallon uh, equivalent, even in the winter, and then in the summer, 118 mile per gallon equivalent. So still extremely efficient in the winter, even though yes, you are getting uh, a significant drop, about 20%, 15 to 20% drop in range due to those colder temperatures. Now, driving strategy is a really fascinating discussion because what I noticed, I was sitting at a supercharger and it was telling me it wanted me to charge up to 90 some percent uh, in order to get to the next supercharger, which was two superchargers down. So there was one supercharger in the middle that I was going to skip. And it's telling me, hey, we're gonna charge up to 90 some percent. You've got 25 minutes remaining that you're gonna sit here at this supercharger. And I thought, well, I don't wanna sit here another 25 minutes. I'll look up and see how long would I have to charge at the next supercharger to then get to that second supercharger. So that's what I did. And I plugged in that second supercharger, the immediate one, and it said, I would only need to charge it for 15 minutes and I could leave now. So I could stay where I was for 25 minutes or I could leave now and charge later for 15 minutes. In my mind, that's a 10 minute savings that I can have. Now, yes, you have to take into consideration getting off the highway and plugging in and you know that little amount of time, but usually these superchargers are right off the highway. And so as a result, it's really not much extra time to just pop off the highway, plug in, pop back right on the highway. So that's what I did. And I took more stops this winter road trip, uh, partially because it had less range, but also partially because it seemed to be a better strategy and so 18 stops in the winter over those 2,000 miles versus 12 stops over the summer over those 2,000 miles. And the average stop duration over the summer was about 40 minutes. Average stop duration in the winter was about 25 minutes. But the most fascinating thing is that I spent the exact same amount of time charging. So in both road trips for that 2,000 mile drive, it was 30 hours of driving, eight hours of charging pretty much, very close to. And so the difference is, in the winter, I needed nine full battery packs in order to make that distance. In the summer, I only needed seven and a half full battery packs to make that distance. So what does that mean? Well, it means that I charged up a full battery pack and a half additional in the same amount of time that I did in the summer. And why is that? The reason why is because I was keeping my battery at a lower percentage. So the battery charges really fast at low percentages, you know, around 10 to 20% up until about 70%, it's gonna charge really fast. Above 70% starts to slow down, above 80% starts to slow down, above 90% really starts to slow down. 
So if you're sitting at a supercharger and it's telling you you need to charge past 90%, you're gonna be sitting all there all day, you might as well just leave it, go to the next immediate supercharger, which is closer, and you'll spend less time charging because you're using that lower portion of your battery rather than that upper portion of your battery, and that saves you time in charging. So. The, the data just shows this from my drive. I mean, I was able to charge an extra battery pack and a half in about the same amount of time just by using a lower portion of the battery and charging more often. And it ultimately meant that this, the road trip, though I required more energy to do it, I did it in the same exact amount of time. That was very cool to me. And it's worth mentioning that I was not stopping at faster superchargers. These were not V3 superchargers. They were all either 120 or 150 kilowatt superchargers, not the 250s. Now, another benefit I had from doing these shorter drives, you know, about 100 miles between stops rather than about 200 miles between stops, uh, the benefit of doing that is that I drove at faster speeds. And the reason why is because I had so much energy. When you're only driving a short distance, you know, hey, I only need this much energy to do it. It's no problem. I can drive at 80, no problem. But if the supercharger is telling you, charge up to 95%, then leave, and you'll arrive at the next supercharger with 5%, then you're thinking, okay, I need to be pretty conservative with my speeds. I need to make sure I actually get there so you don't go over 75 or 70, something like that. So it allows you to use a bit more speed if you do those shorter stops without worrying. Uh, you can still do it, you know, the longer strategy, and then just adjust accordingly. Uh, but when you're doing those shorter stops, it allows you to drive faster. So part of that, I drove at 80 miles per hour um, fairly frequently during this winter road trip, whereas I did not during that summer road trip. Like in the summer, I kept it always at 75. And so if you look at the energy difference required, Tesla submits curves to the EPA. If you look at the energy difference required uh, to drive at 80 miles per hour versus 75, it's about an eight to nine percent difference. So of that, you know, twenty percent uh, extra energy that it took me to go the same distance in the winter versus the summer, uh, you know, maybe five percent of that could be accounted for simply because we were driving faster. Um, so not just because it was colder. So really impressive when you start to look at that how efficient it still was, even though temperatures are ranging from you know zero to thirty degrees. Now, some other variables worth discussing. I did this road trip on 18-inch wheels because, yes, on the first road trip, I blew out a, a wheel, a wheel, two wheels and two tires I destroyed on the first road trip. Uh, that was 20-inch wheels, um, and so I, I learned my lesson from, from that, and I've switched to 18-inch wheels and tires. So these are 18-inch wheels with Michelin winter tires uh, versus in the summer. I did that on the stock 20-inch performance wheel. Uh, with the OE Michelin PS4S summer tires. And so, you know, there is a bit of a difference there, though the 18s that I have on this are not very aerodynamic. So they may provide a small benefit because they're a bit smaller, uh, but they're certainly not aerodynamic looking at them. Uh, and then also you've got the winter tires, which generally don't have super great rolling resistance uh, co coefficients uh, versus summers, you know, which can be a bit harder and they might have a bit less rolling resistance. It depends kind of on temperatures. Rolling resistance wise, honestly, the two tires are probably actually fairly close. Now, one little tip, if you're thinking about doing one of these road trips, one little piece of advice is get your charging done at the end of the night rather than starting your next morning with charging. Because if you show up to one of these superchargers in the morning and your battery's at 10% and it's frozen, it's not gonna charge quickly at all. It's gonna spend time heating up that battery before it charges it up. So after your long day of driving where your battery's nice and warm, pull up to the supercharger, plug in, get it fully charged for the next day or to however much you want, uh, and then head to your hotel room or whatever it is uh, and wait for the next day and start your next day with more battery pack. Uh, that way you start off and you heat up that battery on your way to that next supercharger. Also, another thing, you know, you might wonder how much battery does it lose overnight? And I lost about 10%, about eight to 10% on the three nights uh, that this was sitting out in the cold. I mean, you know, temperature is seven degrees or so. It was, it was definitely cold that it's sitting out there. Some of that, you know, maybe 5% of that, it would lose, uh, you know, just sitting there overnight. And then in the morning, I would preheat the cabin, precondition the battery, uh, and that would use up about another 5% before we started going up. So you might lose about 5% overnight. Uh, and if you wanna just go ahead and start driving then, you can, and you've got extra battery pack. If you wanna get in a nice cozy car with the battery pack preconditioned, you can do that as well. 
Now, let's talk about superchargers because I did encounter two broken superchargers. And so I think the first thing to note is just that uh, throughout all of this trip, I never showed up to a supercharger and there wasn't one available. There was always one available. In fact, most of the time I was the only car there. There's a pandemic, uh, it's winter, not a lot of people are doing road trips uh, across the Northern United States. And so there was always availability and that I think is fantastic. It wasn't something that I had to be concerned about, you know, sitting and waiting around for. Now, broken superchargers, this was my first time experiencing. And that was kind of scary, honestly, because, so what I did is I, I pull up the supercharger, I plug the thing in, it, start making, it starts making these noises like it's trying to latch, but it won't latch. Um, and the little Tesla light is flashing and I look in the car and it's saying either it's not latching or I'll show the message that it was showing. Uh, it's not latching or it's too cold and it's not able to. And I'm thinking like, is it really that it's just too cold and I'm not gonna be able to supercharge because of that? So that was for sure worrying. I looked uh, in you know, the supercharger itself. I didn't see anything blocking it um, from being attached. So I'm not sure you know, why I was saying, hey, something's being blocked. Um, that was concerning for sure, because you know, if that doesn't work, you're stranded. You call Tesla service and you get them to tow you, I guess, to wherever you're going next. Um, or you find a nearby you know, slow charger that you can plug into. So I just went one supercharger over and one supercharger over worked just fine. So the good news is there was plenty available. Um, bad news is, you know, it, there, it is possible to run into a broken supercharger on your trip, which obviously is not ideal. The second one I ran into uh, didn't actually run into because when you look at this, you'll think, yes, someone did actually run into that. Second broken supercharger that I encountered um, the exterior of it was smashed. And so, you know, it may have worked just fine. My thinking is though, this is 150 kilowatts, right? Like you don't want to risk uh, that not being okay. Like that 150 kilowatts in half an hour puts out more energy than I use in my entire house in a full day. So that's a ton of electricity. Um, it's not something you want to mess around with. So if the supercharger looks broken, I'm probably not going to plug into it. Um, so I plugged into a different one. They all worked just fine. Uh, but that one did have that exterior, which had been broken. I, I did peek inside it. It didn't look like any of the wires were actually damaged, but regardless, you know, this is a lot of power you're dealing with. Probably a good idea to play it safe. Now, how much does the trip cost? That's something people are usually curious about with electric cars. How much does it cost to do a road trip like this? And full disclosure, uh, because I have that referral link and people have asked me and emailed me, hey, what's your referral link? Um, I've gotten enough people to use the referral link that I generally won't be paying for supercharging. So for a trip like this, 2,500 miles, if you got three people referred, um, then that's enough to cover that entire trip. However, that said, it's not all that expensive. Um, so for these 2,500 miles, uh, it still shows you how much it does cost at each supercharger. And so my total cost would have been $177.65 for those 2,500 miles. So it's not crazy expensive or anything like that uh, to go these long distances. Now, is it much of a savings over gasoline? Well, in the United States, gasoline is quite cheap right now. So if you were to compare a 30 mile per gallon car buying gasoline at $2.50 per gallon, uh, you know, that's maybe 200 bucks uh, of gas to try to drive these 2,500 miles. So 175 versus 200 bucks, you save 25 bucks. Um, and a lot of people will use this and be like, this is why electric cars are so stupid. Uh, you only saved $25 and it took you so much more time. I, I have a lot to say to that. First of all, this is a Tesla Model 3 performance. Like you don't buy a Tesla Model 3 pretty much any Tesla, to be honest, you're not buying the Tesla to save money. They're expensive cars, all right? When people buy a limited F-150 that costs $70,000, they could buy an F-150 for $30,000. They're not buying the F-150 limited to save money. They're buying it because they want that nice truck. Um, so, you know, buying a sports car is not a financially intelligent move. So there's my spiel on that. The other part is this video isn't saying, hey, is a Tesla the best vehicle for a road trip? No, I use my Crosstrek if I genuinely want to go on a long road trip. It's way more practical. But if you have one car, can this one do it? Can this be the one that does it? And yes, it absolutely can. That's the point of this video. You know, a 20%, you know, max uh, range drop is what I had from driving in super cold temperatures, which isn't a huge deal if this is a rare occurrence. Is it ideal to spend eight hours out of 38 hours charging for a road trip? 
No, of course not. Um, but you can spend that time eating lunch, you know, you can spend that time eating dinner, eating breakfast, going to the bathroom, staying plenty hydrated because you're taking a ton of stops. So you don't have to worry about going to the bathroom. There's always going to be one available. Um, so, you know, it's just a, can it do it? Yes, and honestly, it's not that bad. And that was what was very surprising to me about this road trip, is just how chill it was overall. Uh, I had my cat in the car with me, so part of it from a comfort standpoint wasn't as great because we didn't want to leave the cat in the car alone just in case he got scared or you know he didn't like it regardless um, but he kind of chilled out and just slept you can turn on the rear heated seats and he loved that so he would just sleep on the rear heated seats which was pretty adorable um, so i wanted to keep it you know nice and comfortable in the cabin and then i wanted to stay in the car at supercharger stops to keep my cat uh you know comfortable and so because of that it was less comfortable because i stayed in the car and didn't go out into restaurants or things like that obviously you know during a pandemic it's not like you're going to dine in anyways but um, the option is there in normal times and so you're just i think people overreact on how miserable uh supercharging is because you know you spend 30 minutes at a, at a stop by the time you get out of the restaurant, your car's done and you're ready to go. Like it's it's a pretty nice experience, honestly. It's it's not that bad and it takes out a lot of the thinking for you. It tells you exactly where to go. It's simple to do. So overall, I think the the supercharger, the driving experience isn't perfect. Um, I think it would be cool if they gave you, you know, ways to optimize time-based rather than stop-based. So, you know, hey, I can take more stops, but I'll get there sooner. Um, I think it'd be cool if they had settings to allow for that. There's websites that allow you to do this, but, you know, direct through Tesla would be a cooler solution. Uh, and also, I guess one thing I should mention, because people ask about autopilot, um, I still don't have autopilot, so I'm still driving a dumb Tesla. I'm probably one of few Tesla owners, because now all of them come with autopilot uh, that doesn't actually have it. So for those 2,500 miles, I was using my hands, these like little things on the ends of my arms to like move the steering wheel around, and it was kind of awkward, because I had to like do it that whole time uh, and you know look at the road and whatnot. I don't mind driving, I honestly don't. It has dumb cruise control, so you can set the speed and use a little wheel on the steering wheel to set your speed. Um, so I don't mind driving. Uh, I, I don't mind not having autopilot. Um, people say they really love it. That's great if you do. Uh, full self-driving, of course, not fully released yet. So, you know, the day that I can sit in my garage and say, go here, and I don't have to touch anything and I'm not liable for anything, I am all for it. I think that's amazing. Um, let's not pretend that like driving in city traffic is fun, right? So the day that that comes, cool, neat, I'm excited, perhaps I'll buy it um, and, and have the car do everything for me. But I think we're a bit off. Uh, you know, I think we got a bit of time until that happens. So in the meantime, if you're interested in an electric car and you're wondering, hey, can I actually make a road trip in the winter work? Yeah, you know, honestly, it was surprisingly relaxed, surprisingly chill chill like the uh, you know the cold outdoors all right jason don't explain it so anyways thank you all so much for watching if you have any questions or comments of course feel free to leave them below